afternoon and welcome to our first Auto Talk of 2021. I'm your host, Rachel Soleimani. Before I introduce today's presenters, a few quick reminders as always. Everyone that is registered for today's program will receive a copy by the end of this week. And if you have any questions, feel free to enter them into the lower right side of your interface under the Q&A bar. Today, we welcome back our friends from the Automotive and Dealer Services Group at Moss Adams, tax partner Jack Baker, and senior tax manager Brianne Eagles. Jack and Brianne, I imagine you have a lot to cover today, so I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you again to everyone for joining us today. So a quick summary of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, we'll be covering tax changes from the CARES Act, PPP loan updates, LIFO and inventory. We'll do a post-election tax update and a discussion on some opportunities and compliance issues dealers should be aware of. So the PPP loan program definitely overshadowed some of the tax opportunities that were included in the CARES Act, uh, 163J happened to be one of them. We did get some final regulations for 163J release just this week, just a couple of days ago, which reflect these changes that were included um, in the CARES Act. So prior to the CARES Act, the 163J interest expense deduction limitation was limited to 30% of adjusted taxable income. The CARES Act increased that threshold to 50% of taxable income for 2019 and for 2020. For 2019, partnerships were still subject to the 30% limitation, but if the partnership ran into a limita limitation at the partnership level, the excess business interest that was allocated to the partners could then be subjected to the higher 50% limitation at the partner level. We do have a change coming to how adjusted taxable income is calculated for 163J purposes. It's currently calculated similar to EBITDA, which is you know earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. That changes beginning in 2022 to exclude the depreciation and amortization add back. Without that depreciation add back, adjusted taxable income will in most cases be smaller and more de dealerships may need to use the floor plan interest exception. Uh, the, so the floor plan interest exception is what allows dealerships to deduct all of their floor plan interest, even if they have exceeded the interest limitation, but using that exception prevents them from taking bonus depreciation. So. Dealerships should definitely start thinking now about how that change to the way adjusted taxable income is calculated is going to impact them starting next year. Um, are they going to need to use the floor plan interest exception or are they going to lose bonus depreciation? What's that going to look like for their um, tax impact? Also part of the um, CARES Act was a technical correction for qualified improvement property. We had been waiting for this correction since the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, so since tax reform happened way back in uh, at the end of 2017, uh, the law had an error in it that made qualified improvement property ineligible for bonus depreciation. The CARES Act fixed this and made qualified improvement property eligible for bonus depreciation and made sure that it was 15-year property rather than 39-year property. This correction is retroactive back to 2018. So if you've made improvements in the last few years uh, that might qualify as qualified improvement property, um, there may be an opportunity to pick up some additional deductions. And you know, qualified improvement property, it's any improvement that to the interior has to be non-residential property um, after the building was first placed in service and um, it can't be anything that enlarged the property or certain other types of structural improvements but um, we see a lot of dealerships who have uh, some type of qualified improvement property on the books. 
CARES Act also brought back NOL carrybacks. Uh, these had previously been eliminated under tax reform, so we were only able to carry net operating losses forward. We weren't able to carry them back to prior years. Um, so now losses incurred in 2018, 2019, or 2020 can be carried back five years, which some of that gets back into the lower tax years prior to tax reform, or excuse me, the higher tax uh, brackets before tax reform. Um, and losses from 2017 can be carried back two years. Um, tax reform had also put a limitation on the amount of NOLs you could use per year. So if you had a, an NOL carry forward from a prior year, um, carrying forward, you could only use it up to 80% of your taxable income. Uh, CARES Act removed that for um, 2018 through 2020. So if you have any net operating loss carry forward, um, you can use those up to 100% of your taxable income and whatever's left over is then carried forward to the next year. So PPP loans, um, there is some really good news on PPP. The IRS had issued a notice and a revenue ruling that indicated that the deductions related to your PPP loan forgiveness would not be deductible for tax. So this meant that your taxable income would effectively be increased by the amount of loan forgiveness that you received. Thankfully, the COVID relief package that was just um, signed into law just a few weeks ago, uh, right before the end of the year, did address this issue. So the law does clarify that expenses used to obtain loan forgiveness will be tax deductible. Um, the new law, um, just a couple high points on it. It also had a few other changes to PPP. Um, it added some additional expenses that are now eligible for forgiveness. Those include certain accounting, payroll, and HR software or cloud computing fees. So we think probably uh, your DMS uh, fees probably fall into that category. Um, also certain covered supplies or worker protection costs. So um, if you spent money testing employees um, for COVID or um, you had to put in plexiglass shields uh, to, to protect your workers from customers and all of that, those kinds of expenses could um, well, are now considered to be eligible for, um, for forgiveness if you aren't already um, getting to full forgiveness. The law also introduced a second round of PPP funding. Uh, for borrowers who took PPP one, funds the first round, um, a second draw does come with the means testing. So if you're in a position where you're thinking you need additional funding, um, definitely now there's um, some, some means testing. You have to have had a certain reduction in your revenue in order to qualify. And since most taxpayers uh, did year-end planning prior to this new guidance, um, they were probably following the IRS guidance that we had available to us and assuming that those deductions were not going to be deductible for tax. Um, your fourth quarter estimates could be um, larger than they need to be. So if you haven't made those payments yet, you might consider taking a look to see if um, if they're too high, uh, you know, if they include that, that those PPP um, expense uh, limitations and um, see if maybe you can help your cash flow and keep a little more of that cash on hand now. Uh, it's also advisable to consider any potential state and local tax implications of the PPP loan. Um, this varies widely by state and, uh, you know, different states and localities can, you know, sometimes conform with federal on tax law. So whatever state you're in, just look into that to make sure that you're not gonna have a hit um, with the income from PPP loan forgiveness um, on your state or locality. The SBA um, released a loan necessity questionnaire a few months ago now, back in October. Uh, so this application is gonna come from your lender once you apply for loan forgiveness. So and it, it's supposed to only go to borrowers who received more than $2 million of funding. However, we have seen borrowers with loans under the $2 million that have received requests 
to provide information on necessity. So you may not be out of the woods, even if you your loan was under the two million. The purpose of the form is to collect information to determine whether the borrower had need for the loan they received. It does have a very short response time of only 10 days. So once you receive the application, you only have 10 days to respond. So we definitely recommend that if you expect to get this form, that you repair, prepare the, these responses in advance. Um, since failure to do so um, or respond timely may result in a determination that the borrower did not have need and could jeopardize your eligibility for forgiveness. The SBA also released a uh, procedural notice addressing ownership changes for PPP borrowers. So when there's a change of ownership and they're defining that as a sale or transfer of 20% or more of the stock, um, a sale of at least 50% of the business assets or a merger. Um, so if you have any of these events, the borrower must notify the PPP lender and get approval for the transaction before it happens. Um, it's really important to keep this in mind if you're planning on doing any ownership transfers for estate and gift planning, or if you're considering a sale of your dealership. Um, the SBA also may need to approve uh, the transaction, but there are a lot of exceptions that get you out of it having to go to that level. Um, I've had some clients recently who have been in the situation and they've had to put their PP, PPP loan amount, the whole amount, um, into an escrow account while they wait for their forgiveness application to be approved. So once that gets approved, that it should all get released from escrow. Um, and in these cases, uh, the lenders have been thankfully, you know, been easy to work with, um, but definitely make sure that you're on top of it if you're expecting an ownership change. And the one that kind of gets people that you forget is the estate and gifting you know, still keeping it in the family or, or something like that, you're just giving it to the next generation. Well, that still could, could um, trigger this and you could need to get approval from the lender. Now I'm gonna pass it on to Jack to talk about inventory levels and their impact on taxable income. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I think as everybody realizes, inventories are way down. Um, compared to last year. That's causing quite a bit of problem. What we're seeing is, depending upon your situation, it may not be that bad. What's happened for a lot of dealers is they're only recapturing back to the Great Recession. So if, when the Great Recession happened, most of our dealers, their LIFO reserves, recaptured a whole bunch. And since then, the inflation's been fairly flat, running about 1% a year. So the so the LIFO layers have increased, but not to, to the same um, dramatic amount that was the last time we had the big LIFO recapture. Um, so most cases were in pretty good shape, but not always. We did get to work with NADA and requested relief under section 473 for disruption in inventory. I think we made a very per persuasive argument that the treasury should use their authority they have for relief, um, but I think I'm pretty biased. The code that we're trying to use to get relief for the drop in inventory has been has been out there since the 70s and it's never been used yet. So I think it's important that we all keep our expectations in check. But if if we are, if we do get approval for it, it'll be a great result. Basically, you'll have three years to restore your inventory levels um, and not have not eat back into those layers, which is really pretty important because. LIFO is, is one of those things that once you eat into a layer and it's gone, you never really get to re, redo it. Um, so I think if we can get Treasury to approve this, we'll end up in a great result. If not, it's for most dealers, it's not that bad, um, but, it's, but it's never good to uh, have LIFO recapture instead of LIFO expense. 
I think it is important that everybody does a LIFO estimate. Well, everybody should be anyways, but, but take a careful look at it and see just what's, what spot you're in. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is this year is probably more important than ever to make sure that you've accounted for your in-transit vehicles properly because that will increase your uh, amount of LIFO and have smaller um, decrement. With all that said, if you've never accounted for in-transits in the past, you probably have an issue of all of a sudden starting this year. But if you've been doing in-transits properly, just make sure that you've included all of them. So the decreases in inventory not only impacted LIFO and will increase your taxable income from it, it's also going to increase all the other tax strategies that we do around inventory. So the first one is lower cost or market. Um, we'll, I'll explain in a little bit about the approach we take. I think it's a little bit different than some of some dealers, but we use a proprietary software to annually complete a full electronic booking of all the used inventory. Um, we structure it as a book tax difference. This allows you to keep to manage your inventory um, for operation purposes as usual. Same for reporting for financial statements, but then we take a tax deduction based upon the year-end auction value. Typically, the deduction's pretty good, eight to 15%, but if your inventories went down by half, your used inventory, so is that um, timing difference gonna reverse on you, so you just need to be aware of that. Um, the next one that's gonna be impacted is your trade discounts method. If you're on it, not all dealers are, but it is a nice little tax um, strategy. Basically, basically it's the floor plan assistance and you're allowed to adjust inventory instead of taking in the income. So you're not picking up income on floor plan assistance until the car is sold. Um, it usually runs about one to two percent, depending upon what manufacturer. And then, unfortunately, there's a few manufacturers that don't don't provide floor plan assistance at all, but most do. Um, another one is, and it's not quite as big, but that's your advertising on invoice. Um, this one, the IRS specifically allows you to treat that as an ordinary and necessary business expense. Um, when you purchase the car, not when you sell it. So you're allowed to reduce inventory and take that deduction. Another one that's gonna be impacted, and actually this one might be the biggest one that we're seeing is since there's a lack of product, um, a, lot of, a lot of our dealers, their service loaner fleets are down this year from prior years. Um, for a service loaner fleet, you're allowed to do tax depreciation and with bonus, if you didn't run into the 163J bonus limitation, you've in effect fully expensed um, all the vehicles that you had last year. If you only, end up, only have half of them this year, you're gonna pick up half that amount. It's typically quite large. So just be aware of that for tax planning. Okay, now we'll talk about our the post election election tax update. Um, we unfortunately probably don't have enough time to go through all of the Biden tax proposals, but with the results of the Georgia Senate runoff known at this point, um, general thought is that it's probably more likely that this new administration will be able to move some of the tax policies forward that um, were presented in um, Biden's campaign. Um, I do have slides detailing um, the most significant changes following this. I won't go through them in detail. Um, these are basically these exact same um, charts are available at our website, or I believe Rachel said that she could send slides um, as well to people are here. So if you're interested in digging into those, um, they are available. Um, but do keep in mind as you're going through them that they are just policy proposals. And um, 
you know, the items that he campaigned on. And if the administration does decide to move forward with major tax reform, we would expect that there's going to be a lot of changes and concessions uh, made during negotiations from Congress and the Senate. So um, what we see here is just the information we have available to us on kind of the, the, the ideas of, of what he wants to do, but what is actually able to be done is a, a whole nother story. Um, there is the expectation, of, you know, general consensus is that tax rates may be going up. Um, and so if that's the case, um, there may be opportunities to optimize the timing of income and deductions. So if it looks like rates are going up, there may be opportunities to accelerate income into the lower tax years. So a perfect example of this, if you're, you know, planning to sell property or even your business and you are able to time the sale, um, to fall into a lower tax year that could provide significant tax savings. Um, and on the flip side of that, deductions are more valuable in a year with a higher tax rate. So it may make sense in some situations to hold off on large expenditures or put off implementing a new tax strategy until you, until those uh, rates have increased, if we know they're going to. Um, Always good to just keep these things in the back of your mind. Um, if we know those rates are coming, you know, we can plan accordingly. Probably the biggest concern with um, tax changes that we're, we're seeing our dealer clients come to us with now uh, is about the potential that this new administration may reduce the lifetime exclusion for gifting. That exclusion right now is sitting at over $11 million per person, and most people's estate plans are probably structured, structured around that exclusion right now. So for a married couple, you're getting up to $22 million of exclusion. So you can give $22 million in your lifetime without any um, running into any gift tax implication. Um, so those estate plans likely need to be reconsidered if gifting has not already happened. Um, the common play is to gift in order to lock in the current asset values today. So you're avoiding future appreciation. That's especially true with real estate. If you know it's appreciating, gifting it today at a lower value gives you more um, Give, you're able to use more of your um, or less of your uh, gift tax exclusion um, now rather than in the future. Um, and then to use up that exemption before it is potentially reduced. Uh, we've been working with a lot of clients on this, um, especially through um, the end of last year, trying to get th things done before the end of the year. Um, and on dealerships, uh, we've been seeing valuation uh, come in with 25 to 35% minority and lack of market marketability discount. So again, they're getting a proper valuation and um, getting a value that is lower than market value um, allows you to use less of your, your lifetime exclusion at this point. And some of the gift modeling we've seen has been you know, pretty impressive that really estate planning done well can save you know, more than $10 million. Um, so it really is worth looking at your plan and um, seeing what opportunities may be there uh, to do now um, before there's a potential change. And along these same lines, just a reminder, if you are in California, um, so Prop 19, which recently passed, takes effect February 16th of this year, so just a little more than a month away. It further limits the ability for parents to transfer assets to children without triggering a property tax reassessment. And those property tax reassessments most often increase the property taxes on the transferred property. Um, so there still is time to make property transfers um, if you can um, and take advantage of that before those take effect. So again, I'm gonna pass it back to Jack um, to talk about some opportunities and some compliance considerations. Okay, each year we pick up quite a few new clients dealership clients and we uh, 
often see areas that are either in noncompliance or there's missed opportunities. We kind of listed out the ones that we see the most often with the biggest impact. Um, do keep in mind that as I go through these with the, well, keep in mind that an accounting method change, a 3115 would be filed in almost all of these cases to make a, pay, a, a change. And it'll pull everything into the year that you're doing the 3115. Most of these items that we're, I'm going to talk about here in a minute are automatic 3115, so you have through the extended due date of the tax return to do it. But do keep in mind that with the potential tax rate changes coming on, you will need to really think through what year I'd want to do that. So maybe it wouldn't be 2020 right now. You would wait until the rates go up. I personally think that this is at the historic low for the corporations and for our pass-through corporations. I think that that's going to change. I don't I don't know that it's going to change retroactive to January 1, and I don't know that it'll be right away, but I would think in the next two to three years they're going to go up. Um, but, again, that's just my opinion. Um, every, every taxpayer needs to make their own decision on that. So let me jump into um, – it looks like we've just got a few minutes left. Let me jump into these few items. Um, 163J, pretty complicated area. We're seeing that – Quite a few dealer or quite a few practitioners are messing this up. Fortunately, NADA was able to get Congress to set aside the favorable exemption for floor plan interest, which is very critical to auto dealers. Typically, we see that piece done, but what we're not seeing is they're not limiting the bonus depreciation um, when they use that exception. We're while we haven't seen IRS examinations in that area. We are very concerned that this is something that would be very easy for the IRS to set up a computer matching to just pick that out of the return and send a notice, and I think then you're dead in the water. Um, the next one is the 199, which is qualified income deduction. The elections for it and the past activity elections for around Code Section 469 are not always being made to maximize those deductions. It's it's when you have related real estate or dealership real estate that's in a separate LLC. Those need to elections be, need to be made to combine all that and get the best quali qualified income deduction you can. Um, the next one is the reinsurance reporting. So there's a number of ways to do reinsurance, but most dealers should have a producer-owned reinsurance company to maximize profits and save taxes. There's two or three variants on that. The most popular one um, has become a transaction of interest for the IRS. This, the IRS went through this same thing about you know, five, six, maybe 10 years ago, and they decided there was nothing there. We think that that's the same thing's going to happen again, but we're not seeing this Form 8886 attached to the return. The promoters um, are required to, and I believe they in all cases are, they're disclosing all the taxpayers to the IRS, and so it's a simple matter for them to match it up. And so we think it's really important you do it. And on top of that, I think the the penalties for failure to file this form is pretty significant. I think it's a $100,000 penalty. So just if you have one, make sure it's get, being handled correctly on your tax return. Um, let's see, 263A. 263A is the uniform capitalization requirements. For most auto dealers, if they're making the correct safe harbor elections for dealerships, they should get to um, zero unit caps. They're not having to add anything or very close to that. We still on occasion see practitioners that are, that are misunderstanding the rules or not applying those safe harbor elections, and so they have significant capitalization in the inventory that's not necessary. Um, 
The next one, I think I'm just about out of time here, but the next one is around accelerated depreciation, the asset class lives. Often practitioners aren't using the five-year life for most of the assets that you can. And it's significant enough that off, in most cases now, we're just, when we pick up a new client, we're doing a fixed asset scrub and looking through the missed deductions. Um, and in a lot of cases, it's fairly significant. The other one that's kind of along the same lines is the service loaner fleets. If it's if your return is being prepared by a practitioner that is not um, well-versed in auto dealerships, there's a very good chance they're not depreciating it correctly for tax. What they're doing is they're just, just doing what's on your books, which is, in most cases, what the manufacturer recommends that you do for your monthly um, write-down for the service loaner, the 200 bucks a month or the 300 You get a much different result if you do tax depreciation instead. And with bonus depreciation, if you're not caught up in the bonus limitation, you're writing the whole thing off. Um, the last one I'll chat about just real quickly is repair and refresh. So the IRS issued temporary or tangible property regulations a number of years ago. And it laid out the ability to expense an item instead of capitalizing. The IRS didn't do this out of the goodness of their heart. It, it was came about from the unit of property for um, aircraft, and they kept losing cases that a replacement jet engine is simply a repair and can be fully expensed, even though they're millions of dollars. And, and in, in the past, practitioners had usually looked at a dollar threshold, basically to determine whether something had to be capitalized or not. That isn't the rules any longer. So what we're finding, and it's actually right in this tangible property regs, um, you can have a multi-million dollar facility refresh, and you can qualify for expensing it instead of capitalizing. And, and understand that I'm short-circuited about 30 things that you have to go through to determine if you can get there. But often we can get to pretty much expensing everything in the years placed in service. This is altogether different process than a cost segregation study, and you will get a much bigger current deduction if you qualify, and often you do. We see that miss almost always. Um, so if you if you have a facility upgrade, keep that in mind. And I think that's all I had to to chat about. Jack and Brianne, thank you both for joining us today. This information was so helpful and much needed in this ever changing environment. Again, to those on the line, you should be receiving a recording of the webinar by the end of this week. And if you'd like a copy of the presentation before then, you can give me an email. For more information about AIADA, visit AIADA.org. Have a great day, everyone.